as Franz Schubert started his life as a freelance composer. This life often showed two different sides of his personality. On a typical day, Schubert would get up at dawn. He would sit down at his piano at 6 a.m., then compose for seven straight hours until 1 p.m. Throughout his life, Schubert maintained a very disciplined work ethic, even in the hardest of times. On the other hand, there often seemed to be a desire for a life full of entertainment, socializing, lots of alcohol and tobacco, and very little sleep. In Schubert's circle of friends, one man stands out as quite influential on the young composer, especially in what some would call the more decadent sides of life. Franz Schober was born in Sweden by Austrian parents. Living on the inheritance from his father, Schober was more interested in parties, womanizing and drinking than he was in working for a living. There is an undeniable and strong bond between Schubert and Schober, or Schobert, as they would jokingly call themselves. Schober was probably the person that started the private evenings called Schubertians. These evenings took place in private homes and were by invitation only. After a private concert, preferably with Schubert at the piano, drinks and sausages were being served, followed by a couple of hours of dancing, again with Schubert at the piano. The party would end around midnight. An important person in the Schubertias was an opera singer named Johann Michael Vogel. Vogel was at the end of an impressive career when Schober convinced him to meet the young composer Franz Schubert, who had the reputation of producing songs at a speed nobody else could match. In terms of personality, Schubert and Vogel could hardly be more different. Schubert was the shy introvert who was uncomfortable receiving praise. Vogel was a dominant character who reveled in the spotlight and he was full of mannerisms, not least when he sang Schubert's songs. Physically, Fugel was very tall with a commanding presence, while Schubert was short and often preferred to stay in the background. Despite all this, the two men became good friends and during several summers they traveled together to Fugel's birthplace, Steyr. On one of these journeys, the two were asked to perform for a count and his selected friends. Schubert writes about this event to his brother Ferdinand. The manner in which Vogel sings and the way I accompany, as though we were one in that moment, is something new and unheard of for these people. In 1820, a man called Johann Sen, who was a friend of Schubert, a pretty close friend. They had been at the Staatskonvikt together as kids. He got arrested and imprisoned by the authorities for his revolutionary ideas that he stated openly. In fact, when he got arrested, Schubert was with him and Schubert was also taken to the, taken to the police station. Um, he was imprisoned for 14 months uh, with nothing went to court and after that he was forced to leave the country. Um, he was forced to leave Vienna, we should say, because the countries were different back, back then. Um, and he was never allowed to come back to Vienna. His story was something that probably uh, made Schubert and his friends more careful about what they, what they could say and when. And it's not inconceivable that this was one of the things that created the Schubertiads, which were private evenings in someone's home, invitation only, and the purpose for a Schubertiad was to listen to music, have some good food, and then dance the evening away. Now that was the perfect pretext for also feeling more free to talk politics, for example. Now these Schubertiads, they were, <clears throat> 
they, they have been a little bit, should I say, distorted in their character um, as history has passed. When we think of a Schubert Yard now, we see as in this famous drawing, there is Vogel who is about to sing. You can see his mannerisms already at display and little Schubert is behind him. And everybody is listening to the great genius or to the music at least of the great genius. Was it like this? I don't think so. I mean, we know now that Schubert was one of the greatest composers of all time. But if you take a time machine and walk into that room in that moment when it would happen, I think that for them Schubert was a friend who was a good musician, wrote some good songs, and was willing and able to play the piano for a whole evening, to accompany on the piano first, and then you give him a few sausages, some drinks, and then he would be the house pianist for them dancing away the night with ladies. And I think actually that when I think of the Schubertiads and how they proceeded, I think it's a pity that these Schubertiads was where Schubert made his music. I think it was actually, you know, holding him back both as a pianist, a performer and as a composer. Because what could possibly come out of a private evening uh, with friends who already knew him? He needed to do what every other composer would do. He needed to arrange concerts for bigger masses. And he did once. And it was quite successful. And we're going to talk about the, it in the third episode in this series. And he was extremely happy about it. So this romantic kind of um, storytelling about Schubert Yards, I don't completely buy it. If we go back to the famous drawing of a Schubert Yard by Moritz von Schwind, which is, this drawing is actually made in 1868, which is uh, decades after Schubert died, but it is an interesting drawing for many reasons. You have Schubert looking like he's working so hard there at the piano while Vogel is kind of mannered in how he sits there expanding himself somehow. And then you have many of Schubert's friends around. You have especially this man who is Franz Schober. And if you look around, you have every person listening very attentively to the music, except for, well, Franz Schober. So what does he do? Well, he's flirting with a woman. We have also a mysterious woman who is on the wall. Who is this mysterious woman looking over everybody? Well, we will soon figure that out. Now I'm going to play an impromptu in E flat. And I think it's a very interesting impromptu because you have Schubert and his music and his piano music. And there is lots of uh, a sonata that starts like this, for example. Very lyrical and thoughtful music. And what you don't have that much of is where he goes more virtuoso. And by contemporary accounts, Schubert was not, unlike many 
like Mozart, Beethoven, for example, he was not a, a virtuoso pianist. He must have been a very able pianist, that for sure. But we have no, for example, piano concerto by Schubert. A piano concerto was a way of uh, showing off a little bit as a pianist. Um, and that's why, for example, a, a concerto, a piano concerto has a certain virtuoso quality to it. Now, this piece that I'm playing, that I will play, that actually does have a virtuoso quality, but in a very Schubertian way. It has a middle section, which is more almost like a mazurka, actually. Um, you could, it has this, this rhythm. And it, it almost could be, if you never heard it before, and it could sound like a little bit of a Germanized Chopin. Um, and the outer sections, the beginning and the end, it has this wonderful, it's like a necklace of quick notes just going up and down and up and down on the piano. It reminds me a little bit about the first movement of Beethoven's fourth piano concerto, actually. If you haven't heard it, you should listen to it. Um, and I think one incredibly interesting thing musically with this, um, with this impromptu is that it ends in E flat minor, very dramatic. And is this piece in minor or is it in major? Because it starts in major. And this brings us to one of Schubert's greatest things, what he does with music. It's the relation between minor and major. He has a very, very special way of turning. He often does first something in minor and then he does it the same th phrase but in major and it just it just is warmer and softer and a little bit more far away somehow and here as we know if we play the piece we know that it will end in E flat minor and it starts with one single note which is the B flat and the B-flat will not tell you if it's minor or major. The next one will. If it's, if it's a G, then it's in major. If it's an G-flat, it's in minor. So what I do, what I want to feel here is that when I play this note, the first note, I still don't know. I actually think it's going to be in minor, but instead it's in major. So I think minor, 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 and major. And it's this kind of release of just pearls on the piano, like, like flowing like, like a water. Um, and so, yes, this is a virtuoso piece in many ways, but it has this incredibly lyrical, intimate, wonderfully beautiful quality that never ever leaves Schubert's music, however fast the notes are being played.
In 1818, when Schubert was 21, he spent four months at the estate of Count Johann Karl Esterhazy in Cilic, which is today a part of Slovakia, but then was a part of Hungary. There he took on the duties of being a music teacher to the two sisters of the family. One of them was little Caroline, then 13 years old. Six years later, in 1824, Schubert is again spending time at the Esterhazy summer estate. This time he's being better paid and being housed more prominently. And this time Caroline has turned 19 and she's by now an accomplished pianist. What happened between Schubert and Caroline is difficult to know, but according to Baron Karl von Schoenstein, who was a close friend of both Schubert and the Esterhazys, Schubert fell in love with a gifted Caroline. Baron Schoenstein tells it like this. The family Esterhazy rapidly recognized the musically creative riches that Schubert possessed. He became a favorite of the family, remained during the winter as their music master at home and accompanied the family in later summers on their country estate in Hungary. He was frequently in the Esterhazy home right up to his death. A love affair with a servant, which Schubert began soon after his entry among the Esterhazys, gave way in turn to the more poetic flame which rose inside him for the younger daughter of the family. This passion burned inside him right until his end. Caroline esteemed his talent very highly, but did not return this love. Perhaps she did not realize the degree to which it existed. I say, the degree because that he loved her must have been clear to her from a remark of Schubert's, his only expression of his love in words. When she once jokingly teased Schubert that he had never dedicated a piece to her, he responded, why do that? Everything is dedicated to you anyway. When we read about Franz Schubert, um, there is a lot about circ his circle of friends, the Schubertiads, Vogel, uh, Schober, etc., etc. All those male friends, I don't think there, nobody can deny that there was, um, that it had a huge importance to Schubert for his social life. But were they really the ones that understood his music? Were they really the ones who understood his genius? Were they really the ones that who he could sit down and talk about his love of Beethoven's late piano sonatas? Or were they the ones where he could sit and play one of his late piano sonatas, which are sublime, poetic, and last for 40, 50 minutes? Would they listen to that? I am not sure about that at all. However, thanks to musicologist Rita Stebley, we now know more about the women around Franz Schubert. And there is one woman in particular that strikes me as Schubert's soulmate. And that is the woman on the wall, Caroline Esterhazy. Caroline was 13 years old when Schubert, uh, in 1818, went to their, the Esterhazy family's summer house to teach her and her bigger sister. The, the evidence is, is pretty clear that uh, Schubert visited the Esterhazy house in Vienna from the time she was a kid up until his death. And what is incredibly interesting is that after Caroline's death um, she left a lot of music scores, a lot of manuscripts by Schubert, a lot of first editions of Schubert's music, a lot of music where uh, Schubert had made handwritten notes in, and she had actually bound them in a very careful and beautiful manner, which suggests that she really revered Schubert and his music long after his death. And 
we also find a copy of Beethoven's last piano sonata, the Opus 111. And that is amazing. Why is that? Yes, well, because to play that, you have to, first of all, be a very accomplished pianist, technically. And to appreciate that music, you had to have a really profound understanding of music in general. And for Caroline to play that piece, which is all indications are that she did, and probably with Schubert as teacher, I, I cannot, I cannot see my, I cannot see him discussing Beethoven's Sonata Opus 111 with Schubert or Fogel. I cannot. But apparently he did with Caroline. And must, and it must have meant so much to him. And he was probably in love with her. Now, the social gap was just so immense that it was absolutely out of question, question that they could marry. Um, but it's clear that she had great respect and in her way, love for him. And I think that relationship might have been one of the most important, if not the most important, relationship Schubert had with anybody outside of his immediate family. And it is not a coincidence that one of his great masterpieces, all categories, which is the fantasy in F minor for four hands, one piano. This is a 20 minute long symphony and it has for, for, for four hands and it has this tsunami of emotions uh, coming out and it starts with this beautiful accompaniment, sounds like this. which right away establishes sadness. And then you have this beautiful melody coming up. That's the first little phrase. Now, I, now I'm going to go outside of any facts, I, outside of any, any research and just tell tell you what my musical mind can divert into when knowing about Caroline, knowing about Schubert, and knowing that he wrote this piece, probably to play it with her. I was thinking, since Schubert is, was at the core, after all, a songwriter, what words could you put into this? It would have to be German, in German. Um, so I am not fluent in German at all. So I was thinking about different phrases and I Google translate them. And when I finally hit the one that I would like it to be, it was, can you love me? Because this sounds, this feels to me like a question And I wanted a question, and can you love me? I put it in Google Translate, and it says, kannst du mich lieben? And voila, you have something that fits perfectly to this phrase. Kannst du mich lieben? And again, this is, this is probably not at all what Schubert had in mind or anything, but this is what we musicians do when we have music in front of us that is so fantastic and our mind goes to, to different ideas. And this one, I really like. I really think it's fitting. I really think it plays into what this music is, is telling me. To end this episode, I would like to 
play this piece together with my wife, Shan Shan San, and we will play the first five minutes of it. It's, we can't play the whole piece of 20 minutes, but we will make a separate video with the whole piece. You will only see our hands, and that's because I want you to imagine Franz Schubert sitting with Caroline, playing this together, uniting in music. And if you ask me, I could believe that this was perhaps one of the happiest moments that Schubert could have. And that he had one person that really understood him. And that was Caroline.